Um, hi, everyone. It's an honor to um, talk to you tonight. Uh, it's almost five years since graduation, and uh, Stanford is where I developed a passion for the larynx and for academia. So um, I want to thank you, uh, all of the mentors, um, and also uh, wish good luck to the residents on their uh, path forward. Um, so I have a couple of disclosure for uh, this talk. Um, part of uh, the research I'll be presenting was sponsored by a trilogical uh, grant, and I also have a startup, but that bears no uh, weight on the content of this talk. Here is the outline. We'll talk about first uh, what is cough, and then we'll look at the role of the larynx, talk about the airflow measurements, and then acoustic measures of cough, and then conclude by looking at an application of this concept to a specific problem in laryngology. So what is cough? Well, maybe Kramer has an answer for us. <laughs> what is with that? <laughs> well, it's coffee, Jerry. It expels the disease germs out of the body into the air. And uh, Kramer is right on point, and especially today in the era of COVID-19, the infectious aspect of cough is rather pertinent. Uh, cough is really a sound event or a sonographic event at its core, and it is associated with a particular bodily uh, gesture and also bodily productions of mucus and aerosols. This is reflected in its etymology and also in associated expressions that contain the word cough in English. Uh, cough is from the word, uh, the Dutch word kuch, which is an onomatopoeia and refers to the sound that is produced during cough. In English uh, language, there are multiple expressions that use cough to uh, mean basically producing something. And from a, a more anthropological standpoint, there have been actually a few studies that looked at um, the, the anthropology or the ethnography of cough. And cough is really located between involuntary and voluntary actions. And it is really a chaotic event that we also try to control with a very strict etiquette. Cough is a stigmatizing uh, phenomenon. Uh, we've seen that with Hillary Clinton during um, the presidential campaign. Uh, it is stigmatizing because it is visible through the sound and also the posture it really requires, and also because it is linked to disease and to potential infectiousness. Uh, this is uh, particularly um, relevant today in the era of COVID-19 because the sound, sights, and experience of cough have become part of the public sphere and now have social and even biopolitical implications. Yet cough is really an essential physiological function as recognized from early times, such as uh, by the Persian physician philosopher uh, Avicenna, who in 1025, described cough as the movement by which the body's nature throws the torment away. Which brings me to the more serious part of this talk, uh, which is uh, really that cough is an essential function that really uh, is important, especially in laryngology and especially in those of us who are interested in um, uh, solving swallowing issues and preventing aspiration because cough is really essential in uh, evacuating what went down the wrong pipe uh, in choking or in aspiration events. There are multiple definitions of cough. I like these two, so I put them on the screen. Uh, cough is, um, the cough reflex is the body's mechanism for airway protection, facilitating removal of both inhaled particulates and secretions from the lungs, very similar to Avicenna's definition. And then cough is also a very complex and precisely timed neuromuscular phenomenon that involves multiple muscle groups in the abdomen, in the chest, in the thoracic cavity, um, also in the neck, uh, involving the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. And all of this is under control of both the medullary and higher cortical regions of the brain. There are three types of cough. Uh, there is voluntary cough, which is controlled by the cerebral cor cortex and is under intentional control. There's also a reflexive cough or involuntary cough, which is controlled mainly by the brainstem and is triggered when a threshold of sensory stimulation, either mechanical or chemical, is reached in the sensory nerve fibers uh, located in the larynx, trachea, bronchi, lower airway, and the esophagus. Usually involuntary cough will happen, happen in sequence, so you'll have multiple coughs in a row rather than a singular cough. 
the receptors that um, the sensory receptors that lead uh, to the cough reflex are the slow, uh, slowly adapting stretch receptors, which are mechanical uh, sensors, the C fibers, which are nociceptive chemosensors, and the rapidly adapting receptors, which are uh, mechanosensor triggered by both mechanical and chemical uh, stimuli. And then also important to mention, there is a third type of cough, which is the artificial cough uh, 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 that is triggered by the mechanical insufflation exufflation device. This device is used in patients who have um, um, basically neuromuscular disorders and cannot generate a cough themselves to clear their airway. And this device uh, will insufflate first a, a positive pressure followed by a negative pressure, which uh, simulates the airflow of normal cough and helps this patient clear their airways. And just to give you an illustration of that, here's a short video. The ability to cough is essential to life. The mechanical insufflation exufflation device, known as the MIE, simulates a cough and allows for non-invasive airway clearance. All right. Um, so next, I'd like to talk about the role of the larynx uh, in uh, cough uh, physiology. So over time, with the development of uh, speech in Homo sapiens, uh, the hyoid and the larynx have descended into the neck such that the larynx is really close to uh, the esophageal opening and there is a vertical drop uh, in, uh, that uh, creates a, a very uh, dangerous configuration in the supralaryngeal structures uh, because it puts humans at very high risk of choking and aspiration. And it is thought that this um, uh, movement of the larynx further down in the neck was the foremost driving force for the development of the cough reflex via very sensitive cough receptors, especially in the laryngeal inlet, as a primordial pulmonary defense in humans. Um, there are three phases in cough, and um, the cough, uh, cough involves both abdominal muscles, uh, pulmonary functions, and, and the larynx, but the larynx is really critical in all three phases of cough. Um, and I'll talk about each one of, uh, of, uh, of these phases. So the larynx, besides its uh, sensory input, is really critical in, in all three phases that are listed here. During the inspiratory phase, the vocal fold will uh, abduct, and at that point, a variable amount of air is going to be inhaled, which will serve to lengthen the expiratory muscle and really optimize the length tension uh, relationship of uh, the muscle fibers of the expiratory muscles to, um, to generate a maximal cough later on. And then during the compressive phase of cough, uh, which consists of a very uh, brief period of about 200 milliseconds during which the glottis is closed, uh, the, um, the expiratory muscles are gonna contract and um, this is called an isometric contraction because the muscles are contracting but there's no real change in, in volume against the closed glottis and thus create a positive pressure which during the expiratory uh, phase of cough will lead to um, a rapid peak uh, production of airflow as the vocal fold abduct um, and after this peak airflow, you have a slower uh, decay of the airflow, which I will describe in more detail la later on. So despite the central role of the larynx in cough generation, there have been actually very few studies in uh, laryngology that have specifically looked at the role of the larynx in cough generation. Uh, there, there have been uh, a couple of studies that have looked at the activation of the intrinsic laryngeal muscles of, um, uh, during cough using uh, uh, EMG, and I'm listing one of them here. This is an Italian study, and not surprisingly, what they found is that uh, during the inspiratory phase of cough, the posterior cricoarytenoid and the cricothyroid muscles are contracting, and this is followed by the contraction of the transverse arytenoid muscles and thyroarytenoid muscles during the compressive phase of cough when the glottis is closed. Uh, there's been one study at of uh, the University of Washington that looked at laryngoscopic evaluation of cough in normal healthy patients to see if there was anything that could be uh, induced from these laryngoscopies 
in terms of uh, cough physiology and the role of the larynx in cough. Uh, these, uh, this team looked at uh, the glottal angle formed by the vocal, um, um, by the vocal processes and the anterior commissure and studied basically this angle during the different phases of cough. And what they found was that basically the, this angle was very reliably measured during the expiratory phase of cough when the vocal folds abduct. Um, however, they couldn't really correlate any of these findings to airflow events because they didn't measure those airflows and this study really was not really informative. Um, in terms of the role of the larynx in cough sound production, there is even less that has been studied. And really that's a very interesting area of, uh, of, um, uh, of examination. And I really encourage you to look into it. Um, so we know that cough sound is very personal, uh, is a very individualized sound and it involves both laryngeal and pulmonary components with the vibration of um, the vocal tract of the trachea and also uh, parts of the lower airway, uh, along with a resonance from the nasal cavity and, um, um, and, and the thoracic cavity. However, really the role of the larynx in cough sound production hasn't really been studied since 1965 when Ishiki and Landon really carefully looked at uh, events in the larynx during uh, cough and correlated vibrations of the vocal fold with cough sounds. What Ishiki and Landon found was that uh, during uh, cough, there were two sounds that were produced. There was a first sound that was produced at the beginning of the expiratory phase of cough when the vocal fold initially came apart with a high highly active uh, vibration of, the, uh, of both vocal folds, which was followed then by no activity and no vibration of the vocal fold. But then again, towards the end of the expiratory phase of cough, there was a second sound that was noted in most patients as the vocal fold uh, started to uh, adduct and come back together. Now I'm gonna play a video and I want you to let me know if you recognize this uh, sound uh, or the, the sound of this cough in, in human. Every time the cause of death seems the same, pneumonia. So this is not COVID-19. Unfortunately, bighorn sheep are dying in uh, the American Rockies uh, from a viral pneumonia. I'm playing this video because that's a good illustration of uh, what has been described as a bovine cough, even though we're looking at an ovine species here. The bovine cough is the way uh, the cough of patients with laryngectomy used to be described because it's, an, it's a non-explosive cough that's very uh, specific to patients with no larynx and it can be also encountered in patients with tracheostomy. The reason I bring this up is because if we try to understand the role of the larynx in cough generation, perhaps we should look at patients with no larynx and see how their cough is modified by not having a larynx. There have been a couple of studies that looked at uh, cough airflow in this patient population. This first one coming from Italy uh, looked at cough um, airflows in patients with laryn laryngectomy and compared it to normal patients. And interestingly, what was found was that um, the cough volume acceleration, which is basically the slope of the cough peak flow uh, as a function of time, was reduced in patients with laryngectomy, which means that these patients have a less uh, effective cough. Uh, they also found that the same patients who had laryngectomy on the right side of the screen had a decreased overall cough um, peak expiratory flow compared to normal patients. Um, also, they were found to have a much longer activation of the expiratory muscles uh, during uh, the later part of the expiratory phase of cough. And that also led to a slower decay of the expiratory flow in the later part of cough. Another team at the University of Florida compared normal patients to patients with laryngectomy and uh, their urge to cough as well as their cough airflow measurements. And the finding was that patients with laryngectomy had a decreased urge to cough compared to normal patients. The other finding was that the cough uh, peak expiratory flow was diminished in patients with laryngectomy compared to pa normal patients. 
And uh, similar to the Italian group, this group also found that there was a slower decay in the expiratory flow in patients with laryngectomy compared to patients with uh, to normal patients. And uh, they tried to explain this phenomenon by saying that um, most likely patients with laryngectomy will need to have this longer expiratory phase to prevent re-inhalation of, partic of particulates uh, since their cough is much less effective and less powerful. Next, I'd like to talk about some of the airflow measurements that can be used uh, to study cough. One of the critical parameters of cough airflow measurement is the cough peak expiratory flow, which is basically the maximal flow that happens during cough and is a good measurement of cough strength. Uh, this expiratory flow has been traditionally measured with peak flow meters and spirometers, especially in the clinic and in uh, some of the uh, clinical studies. Unfortunately, neither of these devices is very accurate, especially in low flow situations such as in weak cough, and they're, they're really not um, uh, very accurate. The gold standard for measurement of cough strength is really the pneumotachometer. The pneumotachometer uh, is uh, a tube in which a metal mesh is placed. And basically, as um, the patient is breathing through the tube or coughing, there is a pressure uh, drop across that mesh that is then transduced into an analog signal that's proportional to airflow. This allows you to look at um, um, to look at airflow at every instant um, during, during measurement. Next, I'm going to show you what uh, the airflow measurements look like looks like in uh, using the, tacho, the pneumotachometer. So during the um, inspiratory phase of cough, you'll see uh, basically uh, a flow of air, which is often negative because it's going into the lungs. This is followed then by uh, the compressive phase of cough, which is basically no airflow because the glottis is closed. And then after that, you have, um, as the glottis is opening and the, 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 air, the pressurized air is released, you get to a maximal um, peak um, airflow, which is uh, how we measure cough strength. Uh, followed by a more steady decay of um, of cough uh, of airflow, and then you can have a sequence of multiple cough without any inhalation in between. Also, with the pneumotachometer, you can measure subglottic pressure that builds during uh, cough, and that can also be very uh, important for uh, evaluation of uh, of cough uh, cough strength. So here the subglottic pressure is gonna be in the dotted line. Uh, first during inspiration or the inspiratory phase of cough, you'll see a negative pressure build up as, um, you're, uh, as the individual is inhaling air. And then as the glottis close, closes, you'll see a buildup of the subglottic pressure, which will then reach a peak pressure. And as the glottis opens, a sharp drop in uh, the subglottic pressure as the air is released. Next, I will talk about the acoustic measures of cough. Nowadays, when we think about acoustic data, it's hard not to think about Alexa and Siri and the promise that they will one day diagnose every ailment. Uh, but really, cough sound analysis is not new and has been around since the 1970s. Uh, the problem really with uh, cough sound analysis is really that we haven't been recording them in a systematic fashion and we really don't have very good databases of sound. Um, since antiquity, we know that certain coughs are related to specific pathologies, but unfortunately, we just don't have the data to back it up. There are different features that um, of cough sounds that can be described. There's the character or the timbre of the cough sound the intensity of the cough sound, the duration, and also the frequency. One of the earlier attempts in, um, in measuring cough sound and analyzing cough sound was with a TASI phonography, which is basically a phonogram of cough. Uh, it's basically a study of the acoustic pressure that accompanies cough in the form of a time amplitude wave. 
Uh, so here we don't have any information about the frequency of the sound that's produced. Initially, the 2C phonogram was thought to be a very important tool for diagnosing uh, the di uh, diagnosing pathologies leading to various forms of cough, and also a way to measure the severity of this cough and to potentially see whether antitussive therapy is successful. In these phonographic studies, one cough is sometimes described as a double sound, which, uh, if you remember, was described in uh, was described in 1965 by Ishiki. There's a first cough sound at the very beginning of the expiratory phase of cough, and then following that initial cough sound, there's usually um, a noisy interval on the record which corresponds to the steady state flow with with the glottis open. And then a second sound will appear towards the end of the expiratory phase of cough. And this is thought to be um, more specific to the laryngeal contribution. And you can see here that in laryngitis, for instance, the second sound of cough is more marked. Another way to analyze cough, cough sounds is with spectral analysis. Spectral analysis allows to really specify the timbre or the, the character of the cough sound. Um, the, basically, uh, the y-axis in, um, in spectral analysis corresponds to the sound intensity, while the x-axis is the frequency. And then here, these different windows correspond to different time periods. It's a little bit difficult to really uh, make sense of these graphs. And really, what changed the field of acoustic analysis was in the 70s, when the fast Fourier transform was, um, was developed and applied to uh, spectral analysis to allow to create these spectrograms, which are much more easier to look at uh, and to interpret. Uh, these um, spectrograms will once again allow to look at the timbre or the character of, um, of um, a sound sample associated with cough and to look at some of the qualitative uh, features of the, that cough sound. So on the left side of the screen, for instance, we're looking at the cough of a patient with bronchiectasis, and you can contrast that with the cough of a patient with asthmatic cough. Um, in this asthmatic cough, you can really nicely see the fundamental frequencies and harmonics produced by the wheezes that uh, are so specific to asthmatic cough. Another way that cough sounds have been used in the clinical setting has been with cough counters, uh, which are devices, wearable devices that allow to count the number of coughs within a specific time period. And they're actually fairly commonly used in pharmaceutical clinical trials uh, of antitussive therapy to see whether patients are having any improvement of, of their symptoms. Um, so here I have pictures of two of the common cough counters. On the left side of the screen, you have the Leicester cough monitor, which is basically a recording machine and a contact microphone. Uh, interestingly, the Leicester cough monitor is using a speech recognition device to automate uh, the counting of the cough events. In contrast to the Vitalojack, uh, which is basically also a recording device with a contact microphone and a lapel microphone, uh, which will uh, require a technician to listen to the condensed audio uh, recording and count, manually count the number of calls. And then obviously nowadays, it's hard not to think about machine learning and its potential in the uh, arena of acoustic analysis. Um, and I know I'm talking to the Stanford crew, but just to make sure everyone knows about the definition of machine learning, it's basically a branch of artificial intelligence that automates the building of efficient and accurate prediction algorithms. And one form of machine learning that's uh, become very popular and powerful is deep learning, which uses artificial neural networks that mimic the structure of the brain. Machine learning can be supervised or unsupervised. In supervised machine learning, you need to annotate the features of the data, which is quite labor intensive and can lead to human bias. And in unsupervised machine learning, you basically let the algorithm analyze the data and create insight uh, and have its own insights uh, about the data. But this can be biased by the quality of the data and uh, what's available for, for analysis. Here is how machine learning um, can be applied to cough sounds. 
the really critical part, and I think the most difficult part in applying machine learning to cough sounds is really to create a database of cough sounds because it's not readily available. That's not something that we've recorded over time. And therefore, um, that, that requires a lot of uh, manpower and also difficult IRB processes uh, from personal experience. Then once you have this uh, database of cough, you wanna divide it up into uh, two sets. One is used for training and validation, and another one is used for testing. Um, usually the acoustic data is very messy, so you wanna apply some pre-processing to the acoustic data with some filtering. And then uh, once you have a cleaner um, uh, data set, you can extract specific features and then select features that can optimize your machine learning model for a prediction of diagnosis or cough features. Once you have your machine learning model, you want to test it on the test data and make sure that the predictions are also good with that uh, set of data. Here is an application of uh, machine learning in uh, cough sound analysis. Uh, this group from Queensland, sorry, from Queensland University in, uh, in Australia has uh, basically uh, tried to create a machine learning model that can automate the diagnosis of pediatric uh, um, cough, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, um, in childhood pneumonia cough. And, um, Again, just to go through the process, they basically um, gathered a lot of um, recordings of cough sounds, then divided up that database into a training data set and then a testing data set. And then um, with the training data set, they also added some demographic data on the acoustic signal. They um, uh, broke down the data into segments and then looked at uh, different features within these segments of acoustic recordings. And then basically try to uh, build a machine learning model that would accurately lead to the diagnosis, which they compared to the gold standard diagnosis, which is chest x-ray. Then they applied these machine learning data to the test data and had an outcome of 94% accuracy in the diagnosis of childhood pneumonia based on cough sounds, which is better than the WHO algorithm for, uh, for diagnosis. And of course, nowadays, you've all heard about the different attempts to uh, use cough sounds to diagnose COVID-19. Um, there was uh, a, a nice study that came out of MIT and then uh, our own um, uh, Stanford also had um, its own startup called Verify, um, which I heard about through um, Dr. Santa Maria. Uh, then finally, I'll talk about one application of uh, the concept I've talked about to a specific laryngeal uh, condition, which was important to me because I treat a lot of patients with dysphagia. So we'll talk about cough strength in glottic insufficiency. So glottic insufficiency is the incomplete closure of the vocal folds during uh, phonation and agglutition. This can lead to uh, issues with a breathy voice, but uh, also risk of an increased risk of aspiration. The uh, most common etiology are unilateral vocal fold paralysis or paresis and a press B larynx, although there can be other conditions of the larynx leading to glottic insufficiency. So logically, if you're looking at this larynx and you're thinking about uh, the phases of cough, uh, if you see an incomplete closure of the larynx, you may think that the compressive phase of cough may be affected and it might be difficult to build uh, the pressure, the thoracic and subglottic pressure to generate a strong cough if you have an incomplete closure of the vocal folds together. So that was our driving hypothesis for the project that was uh, sponsored by the Triological Society. Uh, we thought that cough strength is likely to be improved in patients with glottic insufficiency following injection laryngoplasty or medialization. And uh, there were prior studies that looked at the role of glottic insufficiency in uh, and its impact on cough strength. This one study here from Newcastle University compared the cough airflow measurements in normal patients compared to patients with unilateral vocal fold paralysis. Their finding was that though the peak cough uh, airflow was 
uh, about the same in uh, both patient population, the time it took to reach that uh, peak airflow was much increased in patients with unilateral vocal fold paralysis. And, um, and that, that was basically, uh, that determined that th that cough was much less uh, efficient. Another more recent study that came out of uh, Dr. Troche's lab at Columbia University looked at a patient population of, uh, a, um, a population of patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, some of them had glottic insufficiency and some of them had normal larynges. And uh, the group looked at uh, swallowing outcome in this patient population, as well as uh, airflow measurements and urge to cough though they found that objective testing of swallowing was much worse in patients with glottic insufficiency, uh, they found no difference in cough airflow measurements and no changes in urge to cough. Now, I really care about cough strength because it is inversely related to aspiration risk, and that is well documented in the literature. For instance, Abihara in 2003 found that, peak, that cough peak flows were decreased in general in the Parkinson's disease population, and we know this population is at risk of aspiration. Then uh, Kulnik in 2016 found that the risk of pneumonia decreased uh, with increased peak cough flow in acute stroke. And more re recently, Perry demonstrated that cough testing improves bedside swallowing screen in acute stroke. Uh, we also know that by improving cough, uh, cough strength with the expiratory muscle strength training device or EMSD, uh, risk of aspiration can be significantly diminished. This has been demonstrated, for instance, in patients with Parkinson's disease with an improved cough strength used uh, following the use of the EMSD device and a de decrease in their penetration aspiration score on fluoroscopy. And then um, also findings of uh, improved uh, pharyngeal function during swallow with the use of the EMST device. Nowadays, medialization uh, can easily be performed uh, in, uh, in the clinic setting. So injection laryngoplasty is one of the mainstay in uh, correcting glottic insufficiency. And it can be performed both in the office or in the operating room. But nowadays, a lot of uh, laryngologists have, um, uh, are providing that service in the office. It is preferred to thyroplasty in uh, some patients, for instance, when it, when it is unclear whether their para paralysis or paresis is going to be permanent, but also in unstable patients who may not be good candidates for uh, the thyroplasty under sedation. There are different types of injectables used. Uh, we use a lot of calcium hydroxylapatite and hyaluronic acid. And as you may know, there's a new product that came on the market that's silk based. Um, injection laryngoplasty can be performed through a thyrohyoid approach or a cricothyroid approach. There's also a pearl oral approach and a trans thyroid approach. Uh, interestingly, there have been very few studies that looked at uh, the uh, impact of injection laryngoplasty on cough strength. The three studies that have been published have uh, their limitation. The first one only had three patients, and though uh, the author used a, a pneumotachometer to measure cough airflow, um, it is unclear whether the results are generalizable. Uh, their finding was there, there was improved peak airflow measures after injection laryngoplasty, which means that the cough was stronger. And then in 2017, Greg Dion um, did a study looking at 14 patients, but uh, because he used a spirometer, it's really hard to know whether his results are accurate. Uh, he uh, concluded that peak airflow were improved after injection. And then more recently, a group in uh, Korea uh, South Korea looked at uh, six patients with, uh, who had stroke and had a paralyzed vocal fold and underwent injection laryngoplasty and found similarly that uh, peak cough flow were improved. But again, they used a peak flow meter, meter, which is not very accurate, and it's hard to know whether those results are accurate. So uh, we decided to do a prospective study to uh, test out our hypothesis and our goal was to recruit 50 patients and unfortunately COVID happened. So we have half of that. 
Um, this was a study that looked at the maximal voluntary cough produced by patients um, undergoing um, injection laryngoplasty. And we also um, performed recording of acoustic recording of their coughs. Um, we um, then uh, did measurements before and also after the injection, uh, at two to four weeks after the injection when the patient returned for follow-up. Uh, we also collected demographic data as well as uh, their subjective experience of dysphagia and any history of swallowing dysfunction and pneumonia. Uh, because we had money from the Triological Society, we could buy a nice a pneumotachometer um, and uh, again, that's really the gold standard for doing airflow measurements in cough. Uh, here is a video uh, created by some of the students who worked with us uh, on how to coach a patient to produce maximal cough, voluntary cough. Press start. And I, I will now ask Vinny to take three normal breaths just to prepare. Once he has taken three normal breaths, I will ask him to inhale as much as he can and then exhale with a cough. <coughs> Great, one more. <coughs> so um, you can see that uh, we really try to um, coach the patients who provide their maximal cough, but obviously uh, it's never really realistic to know whether that was really the maximal effort. Um, we used a, a power lab to measure certain parameters in uh, the airflow uh, tracings that were obtained, including the peak expiratory flow, the peak expiratory pressure, the compression phase duration, which is the time from the end of the inspiratory phase of cough to the beginning of the expiratory phase when there is no airflow. Uh, we also measure the expiratory rise time, which is the time from the start of the expiratory phase to uh, the peak, to the time the peak of the expiratory flow is reached. And then we calculated the cough volume acceleration, which is a ratio of the peak expiratory airflow to the expiratory rise time. For our data analysis, we used a non-parametric analysis with a Wilcoxon sign rank test and applied it to the same subject before and after injection. This is our demographic breakdown. Uh, as I mentioned, our uh, recruitment was unfortunately stopped by uh, COVID and it's very difficult in uh, cough studies to justify doing studies even today. Um, our patient population was mostly elderly and we had a uh, good distribution between the sexes. And um, the majority of our patients had vocal fold paralysis and uh, a minority of them had a history of pneumonia and almost uh, half of the patient population had the history of dysphagia. Or airflow measure analysis showed that actually expiratory rise time was significantly reduced after injection laryngoplasty, which means that less time was required to reach the peak airflow uh, during the expiratory phase of cough. Uh, this also meant that the cough volume acceleration, which is a measure of cough efficiency, was improved with injection laryngoplasty in a significant manner. Regarding, regarding the acoustic data, uh, we had uh, the great opportunity to work with some of our colleagues uh, in uh, Cornell Ithaca. As you may know, Cornell, uh, Cornell campus is in upstate New York and only the medical school and hospital are in the city. Uh, and we also have Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island now. Uh, but anyways, uh, this was a good opportunity for us to, uh, um, to head to uh, upstate and uh, visit our colleagues and um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology houses uh, the bioacoustics uh, group, which is one of the premier groups in the country that analyzes sounds in nature and especially uh, sounds of uh, different animal species for conservation measures. They've developed a really nice um, software called Raven Pro for um, sound analysis uh, and I think that for all academics, it is a free download and it's a really nice software. I really recommend uh, you check it out if you're interested in acoustic analysis. 
Um, so the reason we wanted to look at acoustic data was not so much to do machine learning, but uh, the interest came from finding a few articles that indicated that acoustic data or uh, that uh, acoustic recording could actually lead to um, um, to prediction of cough strength or peak flow measures uh, just based on certain parameters, such as this group from King's College London that found that uh, acoustic energy and acoustic power were highly correlated with cough strength and the subjective experience of uh, cough strength also in this patient population. Um, and there was another study we found that uh, came from Hiroshima in Japan that uh, was able to create an app-based predictive model that uh, was able to um, infer cough strength based on sound pressure level as well as the age of the patient. So um, using Raven Pro, uh, the software developed by our colleagues, we analyzed the acoustic data of the cough sounds that we had recorded uh, during our clinical study. And then uh, used the experiment rank correlation uh, non-parametric test to analyze the data and found that energy and power uh, of the acoustic data were inversely um, uh, correlated to expiratory rise time. So that makes logical sense because as the expiratory rise time becomes shorter, the coughs becomes more efficient and you would expect that potentially the cough would sound louder or more powerful. Currently, we're working with our colleagues at the bioacoustics uh, group to look at the qualitative analysis of the spectrograms that we have obtained from uh, or acoustic recordings of cough. Interestingly, we're noticing that uh, in these recordings, the second sound of cough seems to be more noticeable after the injection laryngoplasty compared to uh, before the injection laryngoplasty. And if you remember, I mentioned that uh, since the time, since the Ishiki studies in 1965, that second sound of cough was noted uh, to be present in some patients and uh, to be perhaps more specific to the larynx. This is another example of the second sound of cough becoming a little bit more uh, noticeable after the injection laryngoplasty. Again, we're doing some more qualitative studies right now and, um, and I'll hope to share this result with you in the near future. Uh, there are limitations to this study, including that uh, we were not really measuring pulmonary function testing either before or after these cough strength measurements, and it is unclear if that could be um, a confounding factor. There were also multiple etiologies of glottic insufficiency in our patient population. We also used different injectables depending on uh, which of the attending was performing the, the medialization. And um, also our study could be criticized because we're asking patients to perform voluntary uh, cough for cough airflow measurements. And yet what really is more relevant to swallowing, for instance, is the reflexive cough um, which can be induced, for instance, with uh, inhalation of capsaicin. And then finally, uh, we uh, had some, somewhat of an arbitrary time timeline for measurement of uh, cough strength following uh, the injections. Most of our patients came back to clinic around two weeks, but it's not clear if that's clinically relevant or if we should look at a longer timeline. So in conclusion, the role of the larynx in cough airflow and sound production is still poorly understood and can be a rich field of research for uh, uh, the new generation of laryngologists. There is a dearth of data on the impact of glottic insufficiency and medialization on cough, uh, on cough strength. Or preliminary data suggests that cough volume acceleration or the efficiency of cough is improved after medialization. And finally, cough sounds, if correlated with cough strength, could be broadly used as a clinical tool for screening uh, patients with swallowing dysfunction. And with that, um, I'll open the forum for questions.
Hi, Anani, Anais. Uh, really, uh, congratulations on, on getting getting that work done uh, pre-COVID. I'm sorry that you weren't able to, to get any more done. Uh, I'm curious, actually, if um, the the patient population that you enrolled, were these all acute uh, paralyses, pareces, or are these some of these longstanding uh, ones or, or uh, maybe even vocal fold immobilities from, from some sort of mechanical uh, reason? Yeah, so we had a mix of patients and that, that really is potentially a limitation of our study. Some of these patients had uh, glottic insufficiency, um, you know, because of mm -hmm. uh, press larynx, some of them had a more acute uh, vocal fold paralysis. Sorry, I'm getting text mm -hmm. from colleagues here. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and some of them had, um, you know, either a chronic paresis or um, I don't know how the patient population is uh, in California uh, nowadays, but in New York, a lot of patients prefer these non-invasive office-based procedures over uh, ferroplasty. So some of these patients also were getting, you know, um, regular injections to correct their uh, glottic in insufficiency and, and were maybe getting their third annual um, injection. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's definitely a little bit of a confounding factor, right? Because like, if you, even with voice patients, like the chronic paralysis patients, sometimes will will have, uh, you know, figured out ways to to get some of their voice back, uh, their their vocal strength back, and I imagine that that you would be able to get some of the the cough strength back, even though the glottic insufficiency uh, is is uh, is still there. Um, were you able to correlate any sort of, or did you try to correlate any sort of vo uh, vocal strength with this or, um, or like maximum phonation time to, you know, no, as, and a, that's, as a yeah. surrogate? Uh, that's a really good point. And that's definitely um, another study that we're performing um, by uh, collecting acoustic data in patients who um, are aspirating and those who are not aspirating. And one of the things we're measuring is maximum phonation time, uh, but not in this study, because in this study, we really specifically wanted to look at cough strength. Um, and we just didn't want to add uh, too much more to the protocol because it was already a pretty lengthy one. Yeah, there are a lot of factors to tease out uh, in this, but it's nice to, you know, it'd be nice if you can come up with a, a nice bedside uh, a bedside evaluation tool, uh, you know, to, to make things a little bit easier for our, our SLP colleagues. Sure, yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. Hi, Anais. <laughs> <laughs> it's Lisa. Oh, hi, Lisa. Hi. It's nice to see it's you. It's just so good to see you. I wanted to, to thank you for the fabulous talk and to congratulate you on your baby. Thank you. And thank um, you. it's just so exciting to see how you've combined so many of your interests uh, from lifelong interests, really, into your research program. It's, it's really impressive. And we're proud to say we knew you went. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> We can't wait for you to come in person. <laughs> in the near future, hopefully. We hope so. Great talk, Anais, and thank you, and uh, congratulations on everything, the accomplishments and your baby, and happy birthday. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you Hi, so Annie. much, Anais. Great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So nice to see you back. We look forward to seeing you again out here sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let me know if any more questions. If not, have a lovely evening in California. Thank you, Anais. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. All right. Get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>